Um, our next part, uh, I'm going to keep this brief because we all know Elliot. He's one of our keynote speakers for today, and we all hear him on the radio and see him at events like today. He's always provided some of the best insights into the macroeconomic issues and brings it down to local impacts here in the state and city. His full bio, again, is in the program. I want to make sure that he has as much time to talk about. Elliot, I promise we did not buy you a Kachina doll, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, big running joke for at least 15 plus years about the Kachina doll. So with that, please welcome Elliot Pollock to the Now, 
Uh, it's bad in the long run, but in the, in the near term, that's a lot of stimulus. Uh, all right, so what keeps me up at night? Uh, what keeps me up at night is there are 7 million unfilled jobs in America. For the first time in history, there are more unfilled jobs and there are people unemployed. Uh, that's remarkable. Uh, and uh, for, since 2011, you have growth in the, la in the in employment, it's higher than the growth in the labor force. An economy's ability to grow is a function of two things. Hours worked, which is the number of people in the labor force and how many hours they work, and productivity, growth in how productive those people are. Well, uh, the growth in the labor force is slow. When I was a kid, the labor force was growing at 4 or 5%. It's now growing at 1.2%. And you add that to a typical growth in productivity of, of 1.3%. The economy can't grow much more than 2 to 2.5% for any extended period of time, but it can continue to grow. But this is a problem uh, simply because it's starting to push up prices, uh, labor prices. And that's what the Fed's going to be watching. Uh, other things that bother a lot of people more than bother me, and that's bear markets. Well, uh, this is the cyclically adjusted PE ratio. And it, the only times it's been higher in American history are October 1929 and 1999 and 2000. So prices are high, and, and that bothers a lot of people. I will point out that the stock market is a terrible indicator of recessions. There have been 37 corrections since the end of World War II, corrections declined 10% or more. 12 have been associated with recessions, 25 have not been associated with recessions. And even in bear markets, uh, there have been 11 bear markets and seven have been associated with recessions, four have not. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock in that. Uh, the treasury, this also bothers me, the, the, uh, let me go back. The, uh, tre the spread between 10-year treasuries and two-year treasuries, which historically has been the best indicator of recession, is approaching to that line where you say, okay, there's a problem here. It's since backed off from this, but essentially it's an issue. But that is a long indicator. Uh, this, this is the last several recessions, and essentially it's probably on average 18 to 20 months between that turning negative and there's a recession. And I think most people would not be surprised if there was a recession, a mild one in 2020, 2021. So, uh, but overall, uh, we're, we're in good shape. Uh, pending home sales, uh, that's been a problem. We'll talk about that at nauseum. And uh, this is the only one that really bothers me. Corporate debt outstanding as a percent of GDP is the highest ever. Uh, corporations took advantage of low interest rates to finance the hell out of themselves, borrow a lot of credit. And uh, uh, whether this comes back to bite them remains to be seen. But this is, of all these negatives, this is the only one that really bothers me. Um, I'm going to skip this one because I don't want to talk about it. Let's talk about trade wars. Okay? Uh, people overreact. This is all about um, uh, U.S. and intellectual property rights with China. Uh, people were worried about what happened in Canada. Canada retaliated. They decided to build a wall. And we have a picture of their demonstration project on, on the wall they're going to build. <laughs> What you got is uh, the effects of a trade war, higher input prices, they bring back jobs supposedly, but probably in a minor way, but it's all about intellectual property rights. Uh, an American technology company opens a plant in China, guess who gets their technology? China does. Guess what they do with it? They essentially reproduce this stuff and they sell it all over the world as their own goods. And I think that's really what this is about. Now let me give you the, the reasons why China can't win this. Basically, 4.6% of China's economy depends on exports to us. Seven-tenths of 1% of our economy depends on exports to China. China can't win that battle because they basically are too dependent on us. Uh, and the, the other reason that, that, that it's a big deal to us is 65% of our trade deficit is with China. $365 uh, uh, billion dollars a year. The next largest trade deficit is with Mexico, which is 71 billion, and then Canada, which is 19 billion. So essentially, uh, this is not about uh, the price of imported dresses. This is about China agreeing not to steal intellectual property. 
And once they do that, this will all go away, just like uh, the problem with the countries uh, in Mexico and, and uh, Canada went away. Uh, China needs to keep uh, exporting to uh, create jobs, and I think the last thing they want is a recession in the U.S. Now, this cycle is no spring chicken, okay? This is an old cycle. In fact, by June, it'll be the oldest cycle in American history. Think about that. Uh, this is the, the longest expansion uh, in American history, and uh, will be. And, uh, but it's not over. Uh, expansions don't die of old age. They die because something's wrong. Uh, you, the, the major ones have to do with the tightening of credit markets. Uh, there are also credit bubbles. Uh, which are rare, and there are, to me, asset bubbles, and there are exogenous shocks like wars, like 2000 was caused by uh, a, a war. Uh, essentially, there aren't really a lot of reasons to have a recession right now. But just like people, uh, as recovery gets older, it becomes more vulnerable to shocks, and uh, my concern at the time is banks overreacting because the last thing, that, the first thing they're going to think about is 2007 through 2009. So where does that leave us? Okay. Well, 2019 is probably going to be a good year. Uh, it's not going to be as good as 2018. It's going to have slower but continued growth. You have tax cuts. You have deficit spending. You have plant equipment spending. That should keep things going. And I think the probability of a recession this year is relatively low. We're probably in the eighth inning. Um, uh, anybody recognize this picture? Jerry might be the only one who's my age. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, uh, uh, perfect game? That's exactly right. This is Don Larson's perfect game. Um, and uh, not all recessions are the same. This, this is what I want to point out. This is my, if, I, if there's one thing you come out of here today with, it's this. Okay. Uh, first, this is not a barcode. And I stole this from Cushman and Wakefield. I appreciate it. All right? This is a history of U.S. recessions back to 1860. And you can see, up until the Great Depression, recessions were long and frequent. Now they're not so long, and they're not very frequent. Uh, in fact, there have been uh, a, a number of recessions, uh, 11 to be exact, since the end of World War II. Only three have been significant, and, and those three all had specific reasons. 73 through 75, you had an oil embargo, you had wage and price controls, and you had you, you went off the gold standard. So there was a lot going on. Uh, 81, 82, inflation reached 12%, uh, and, and the Fed really had to do something. So Volcker and, and Reagan essentially tightened the thumb screws until inflation got under control again. In 2007, 8, you had a housing bubble uh, caused mainly by bad government policy. And uh, uh, essentially, uh, none of those things or anything like that appear to be on the horizon right now. Other than that, uh, the average recession lasted 8 to 11 months and was relatively mild. So even if you have one, I'm not particularly worried. Um, again, the eight that have not been, there have been eight that have not been severe, they lasted 8 to 11 months, caused my imbalances due to overheating, usually credit induced. Usually the Fed, the Fed always tries for a, uh, a soft landing, you've all heard that. They usually fail, okay? Uh, and, the, and that's because you've got millions, billions of moving parts, and mainly banks getting too scared and, and, and tightening too much. But right now, employment is growing faster than the labor force, and, and that might push up wages, and the Fed will continue to watch this, but they don't want a recession. It doesn't do a lot of good right now. And uh, uh, there's nothing that suggests that if there is one in 2020, that it's going to be sh anything but short and, and uh, uh, well balanced. At any rate, uh, the people at the uh, University of Arizona uh, keep on looking as to why it's so hot in Arizona, and they finally found a reason. And they they uh, now have redone our solar system, and this is the way it now works. <laughs> right. So there's a, a new norm. There's a new norm in, in Arizona. <laughs> that will cause us to go from being the second most fast, fastest growing state to being the fifth or sixth most fastest growing state. It's kind of uh, almost not worth talking about, but I have all this time to kill, so I thought I'd talk about it. Uh, first, in 2018, we were the state with sixth in job growth, um, and historically, uh, prior to, to 2000, 
seven that you'd say that's okay. Uh, then we have ran into some problems. Fifth and sixth, like last year and, and this year, really are, are to me, 17 and 18, are really pretty good. And in fact, uh, uh, we are sixth, but by the time the revisions and employment are done, we could easily be fourth, whatever that's worth, because they, they're, they're all grouped together that closely. Uh, by the way, um, uh, I say this, uh, and I, the reality is that uh, uh, 80, 7% of all the employment growth since the recovery began has been in greater Phoenix. The rest of the state can disappear, nobody would notice for several weeks. <laughs> so essentially this is where the jobs are, this is the economic driver of the state, and that's going to continue. In fact, uh, Phoenix was the, there are 36 major employment markets in this country. Major employment market has more than a million jobs. Uh, Phoenix uh, was fourth, but once again, if you take a look at the data, uh, it could easily be third. Uh, it's essentially Phoenix and Seattle are in a dead heat. Uh, only Orlando and Austin uh, uh, have done better, and Orlando, they opened two 7-Elevens in another amusement park. <laughs> All right, so what about jobs in Greater Phoenix, okay? Uh, in terms of net job growth, it's been construction, education, health services, professional business services, leisure, hospitality, and manufacturing. That's where the jobs are. In terms of percentage growth, it's the cyclical industries, construction and manufacturing, that are doing extremely well and are likely to continue to do well, followed by the, the usual suspects, which are education, health services, leisure, hospitality, and professional business services. And that's likely to continue to be the case. Employment, uh, again, this goes back to 1988. Uh, the percentage growth in the 90s was very high. It jumped again in 2005, four and five. But essentially, we're doing very well. Uh, and employment in, in December was up 3.7% from a year earlier. That's, that's pretty, pretty darn good. Uh, in absolute numbers, we created 67,000 jobs last year, uh, year over year. Uh, that's, that's a lot of jobs. This year, it'll still be over 60,000 jobs. And again, we're probably doing a little more than twice the, the national average. <laughs> Let's talk about population flow. So this is what's changed when I said that this is the new reality. And the new reality is Americans aren't moving. Okay? Not nearly as much as they did. This is the percentage of people who move from different states, from different counties, or internationally. If you move from Chandler to Gilbert, you didn't add anything to the economy of playing musical chairs. These are people who actually will add something to where they end up. The economy uh, we used to grow between six and seven percent of the population used to move every year. Now it's down to four percent. Who isn't moving? Millennials. Millennials aren't moving. Uh, for a while they couldn't afford to. Uh, when they get back in the game, maybe this will go up. But right now, this is the new reality. And if you take a look at who's not, where they're not moving from, basically it, the people aren't moving from state to state. Uh, and again, this will change. The good news is that Arizona now captures 7% uh, of everybody who moves in this country moves to Arizona. Think about that. For 2% of the country's population, 7% of everybody who moves ends up in Arizona. And by say, when I say Arizona, most of those are in Greater Phoenix. Uh, that's simply remarkable and suggests that people uh, are going to continue to vote with their feet for us, that there was an aberration in 2005 and 6 because of the housing bubble. There was an aberration during the Great Recession. But essentially, people still vote for Arizona with their feet. That hasn't changed, and I don't think it's going to change. Um, uh, I'll just digress a second. Um, in 88 through 92, we had ASCAM, we had a governor impeached, we lost the Super Bowl, we crossed the Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, it was just uh, every SNL in, in the state. Closed. We, uh, we essentially lost every bank except for one uh, to an out-of-state institution, and we ultimately lost that one. And everybody said, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And you know what the effect on long-term growth was? Zero. Okay. This time around, we had 1070. We had this housing disaster. We had the slowdown in population, which affected a lot of things. 
and everybody is saying, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. And you know what the long-term effect on growth is going to be? Zero. Okay? Uh, essentially, this, the dynamics are too good here. Uh, people like it. It's pro-growth. There's just a lot of things uh, that are positive for Phoenix, and the long-term outlook I agree with Jerry is, is just spectacular. Um, moving forward, this is the U.S. population. Uh, we, when, when I was a kid, we were growing at 1, 1.2%. 1 uh, I guess I was a kid back until 2000. Uh, now we're growing at 6 tenths of 1%. The birth rate in this country has dropped dramatically in mortgage purchase applications. So it really starts to peak in, in, the, in the late 20s and stay high in the early 30s. This is what it looks like today. This is what it's going to look like five years from now. Okay. Tremendous demand, tremendous demographic demand for housing. And so I, I, don't, I can't tell you what's going to happen three months or six months from now, but I can tell you over the next five years, housing is going to be insane. And uh, the big question is how they get the labor to build all these, these houses. And, and, uh, uh, but I'm really optimistic about it. On top of that, the important takeaway from this one is that they take a look at the middle column percent, who essentially total occupied in single family housing. This is the propensity to buy a home as opposed to living in an apartment. And the propensity to buy a home in your 20s and 30s and 40s goes through the roof. So not only are there so many more millennials, but they're reaching an age where they're more likely to buy a home. Again, just tremendous pent up demand. Uh, so let's take a look at, at where we stand. Uh, this is month supply. Any sign of overbuilding there? No. Uh, days on market. Is it low? Absolutely. Days on market for homes under $250,000? Very low. Uh, new home inventory? Very low. Developed lots? Very low. Uh, foreclosures? Almost non-existent. Um, so there's no sign of any problem that, that would suggest there's going to be any real long-term issue with housing. Uh, even a short-term issue would be surprising. This is nationally where the demand is going to come from over the next 10 years. Virtually all the demand in housing nationally comes from one group. Those people born between 85 and 2005 millennials. We'll talk about them in a minute. In Arizona, it's a little more spread out uh, to uh, because, and Gen X because of people moving here will will have an impact as well. But essentially, if the whole the major story in housing is millennials. Uh, housing troubles, affordability, as we'll talk about, is a major issue. Greater Phoenix affordability is slightly less than normal, but not much. And the pent up demand is massive. Uh, all right, so this is 30 year mortgage rates. Uh, the red line is uh, against where we are today, it's like slightly under four and a half percent. The reason that you're not getting a lot of people who are in existing homes moving is because most or a lot of them over the last eight years have gotten mortgage rates uh, in the threes. And they don't want, they don't want to, you know, they'd rather fix up their house than take a five percent mortgage. And then there's probably a little sticker shock on the part of millennials. I think that'll be temporary. Every 100 basis point increase in mortgage rates reduces demand by about, you know, by about 7% in terms of affordability. So it becomes a problem, and home builders going to have to learn to deal with this. Uh, this is the Housing Opportunity Index. The red line is Greater Phoenix. It's now, um, uh, you know, basically close to 60, which is just slightly under the historic average. But that doesn't bother me very much. In addition, Phoenix is probably the most affordable major city in the Western United States. Uh, Albuquerque is more affordable, um, and that really affects the three people who move there every year. <laughs> Tucson is more affordable, and uh, that's great for retirees. Uh, but basically, uh, in terms of affordability for major cities, is it cheaper in Detroit? Yeah. Anybody here want to move to Detroit? I don't think so. Okay. But if for a major western city, Phoenix is it. Uh, this is, gives you an example. This is a five million dollar home in Phoenix, California. And affordability is the key concern for millennials and for the retirement population. Uh, by the way, this, this 
supposed to be a joke, but it's a, a real, a real sign. You can get into a nice tract house for only a million dollars in San Francisco. Okay, so make sure you run up there. Uh, okay, this is uh, the top ten home builders in Greater Phoenix. Uh, what do they have in common except for the one in red? They're all affordable housing. They're all under the FHA limit, which used to be 294, now it's 315. But essentially, uh, this is what people, where people are buying. Uh, all the top selling uh, subdivisions uh, are basically smaller lot, lower price, new home communities, targeted entry level and value oriented buyers. That's where the market is, and that's where the market is going to continue to be. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little about millennials. How do you identify a millennial versus a baby boomer? Well, here's how you look. This is a uh, millennials. Uh, I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may update your Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Baby boomer is a little different. Here, the, let me go back. The, the woman is saying, "You told me you'd spend your whole life uh, trying to make me happy." And the guy is saying, "I didn't expect." <laughs> between baby boomers and millennials, 68% of uh, baby boomers were married, 40% of millennials were married. Never married, 20 versus, what's that, 53. Age at first marriage, 25 versus approximately 30 for males, 22 versus 28 for females. Delayed marriage. Uh, age at first child, 23 versus 27. Uh, uh, living in an independent household, 84 versus 58. Living home with mommy and daddy, 9 versus 22. Okay, it's remarkable. Uh, millennials, uh, I, I used to say they were uh, lazy and shiftless, and then I, since I have four millennials that are all gainfully employed, I can't say that anymore. Uh, but uh, millennials were hit with several factors that really changed their lives that, 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 that most people tend to overlook. Uh, most of them were overprovided for, and so they uh, they went to school to get that Russian literature degree, and they got out of school, and there were no jobs. Uh, and so this guy ended up being the most highly educated sales clerk at Macy's. Uh, greater acceptance of large amounts of student debt, which essentially is real, and for about 30% of millennials who come out with student debt, uh, they have purchased their home in the form of a dorm room. Uh, and then the social mores change because of these economic conditions. They delayed marriage. Why? Because they had to. They couldn't afford to get married. A mom lived home with mommy and daddy. One, because mommy and daddy overprovided for them. And two, because a lot of them had to. They had no other way. And three, they became less materialistic. This is my favorite one. They became less materialistic. Why? When you have no money, what are you going to do? <laughs> All right, so, all right, so now these things are turning the other way around. Uh, it takes about 10 years to pay off student loan debt, and so a lot of, in the next several years, you'll start to see a lot of millennials who are out of the housing market finally being able to save up for a down payment. Uh, the, the major beneficiary of a strong market, unless there is some major changes in immigration policy, and I think everybody knows uh, the odds of that, um, uh, there is going to be a perennial, perennial labor shortage in this country for the next 10 to 20 years. And so they'll be a, a major beneficiary of the higher wages that causes. And finally, uh, they are going to realize when their girlfriends get to about 35 that they're subject to the laws of biology and there is an inherent drive at that age to have kids. Um, uh, I've got kids that age and I can tell you it's quite real. They, they, they make up their mind, guess what, we're having kids. We, um, and, all right, so, what did I miss? Okay. So this is what I thought you think of millennials. This is the prime of my life. I'm young, I'm hot, and I'm full of crippling debt. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about that. I'm not going to go into the numbers, other than to say that 70% of students leave college with debt. Standard repayment is 10 years. 60% don't expect to pay it off until the early 40s. A lot of that, however, is people who went to uh, either trade schools or online schools, a lot of whom never finished, so they got the debt without the benefit of something that would get them higher incomes, which is unfortunate. But for the average guy who graduates from college, it's probably paid off within 10 years after they graduate, which is between 21 and 25. 
uh, uh, thirty percent of those eighteen to forty have so much debt that they can they can't buy a home, and that's going to uh, 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 slowly get lower. But essentially, they were sold a bill of goods. Um, this is the uh, the uh, uh, housing bubble of our decade. Uh, however, since you can't dismiss it in bankruptcy court, you're stuck with it and you actually have to pay it off. Uh, it, it, but it, it, things will get better quickly. 95% uh, of those people in apartments say they plan on owning someday. 46% the, say the biggest obstacle is saving for a down payment. Uh, so I, I think that, again, there's nothing here that says to me that the housing market isn't going to boom over the next several years. Uh, I thought I'd mention this too. Uh, everybody says, oh my God, look at all these rental houses. A house doesn't care whether you own it or you lease it. A house only cares if people are in it. So all these people have done is move uh, the demographic to renting, but they still, uh, still more than 70% of all the occupied housing in Greater Phoenix is single family homes. Uh, so what's going on? The move up market, uh, again, it's interest rates. First time home buyers shocked by recent interest rates, uh, and there are more renters, but uh, they're going to be in single family homes, so the, the demand is really good. Uh, conditions uh, are the polar opposite of where it was in 2007 to 11. No signs of oversupply. Signs, there are lots of signs of pent up demand. Uh, affordability becomes an issue, and uh, housing is under pressure, but the out right now, but the outlook for the next five years is just sensational. Uh, slow down in single family housing is likely to be transitory. Let's talk about apartments. Um, same, the same demographics that make single family spectacular make apartments spectacular. And, and as you can see, really, the last two years you've had more change in inventory than absorption. Uh, I think that that will even out. Um, uh, and I, again, a lot of deliveries. Um, and uh, a lot of deliveries continue into 18 and to uh, 19 and 20. Uh, that's okay. Uh, but here's, here's what bothers me. The high-end apartment demand will continue to be strong, but there's a lot of high-end high supply coming in the market. Uh, now, um, I, back in the 70s, I read a book, read a book uh, by a guy named Robert Ringer called Winning Through Intimidation. It was about real estate. It was very fun. And the, the one thing he, he said, the one quote in that whole book that stuck in my mind all these years later, was that a builder would build a high rise in the middle of the Gobi Desert if he could get the financing. And that's absolutely true. Real estate is 100% finance driven. And, and uh, so essentially, um, uh, again, there was a lot of financing for high-end apartments, not for worker housing. Uh, uh, and so you have a supply demand balance. Um, that's not that fun for you. Uh, uh, so, what, here's, here's where the demand is. The demand is for worker housing, which is people between 60 and 120% of median income. It is not subsidized housing. It's cops, firefighters, teachers, retail workers, hospital workers. Basically, the guts of our economy is having a tough time with affordability of, of apartments, and uh, uh, which is 20 to 30% of their income going to their housing. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, a lot of this has been uh, redone, renovated, and is now out of their price range. And nothing's being built there. Uh, in, in the meantime, rents continue to go up in Phoenix. And uh, uh, it's, I know a lot of people are trying to get in that market, but if you can build an apartment, I don't think you can for a, a buck thirty to a buck sixty a square foot uh, in terms of rent, you will have people lined out the door. There's, there's, that's where the, there is a, a supply-demand imbalance. Uh, vacancy rates are still low, although they're going up a little. I'm not concerned. Office, industrial, and retail are a function of employment and population. And while those will be slowing a little, they look really positive for 2019. So I'm not really concerned. Let's take a look at office. Um, vacancy rates never got as low as they did in the, in, uh, after 88 through 92 but they're still reasonably low. Um, and again, the red line's absorption, the blue line's new supply. Absorption's still outrunning new supply. Uh, and, and the numbers are staggering. Uh, according to the latest numbers we have, uh, uh, absorption last year was about 2.4 million square feet. Uh, change in inventory, 800,000. 
I mean, that's quite an imbalance. Um, the, uh, and and uh, again, the, the market, 89 million square feet. Uh, uh, and then where, where uh, 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 what's available? Mainly B space, some A space. Uh, and under construction, not enough to, you know, it's not a lot. Uh, industrial, same situation. Uh, vacancy rates might go up a little, but you still have absorption outrunning new supply, at least now. And, and the numbers are staggering. This, this is the one market where the numbers really got back to where they were uh, in, in, in near the real estate boom. Uh, you had almost 10 million square feet absorbed. You had 9 million square feet coming on the market. That's, you know, that's, that's, those are very big numbers. Uh, and according to the latest numbers that CB gave us, there's about 6 million square feet under construction at the present time. Obviously, you have to look at it by market. Uh, and uh, uh, vacancy rates are low. So again, unless the economy falls off a cliff, and I just don't see that, this market remains strong. Uh, retail, on the other hand, you can't win them all. Uh, uh, again, vacancy rates are not bad, uh, except for one itsy-bitsy thing, you have no absorption, okay? Uh, and uh, again, take a look at pre-2008 and then after 2008. It just is remarkable. Um, uh, last year, uh, you had 150,000 square feet absorbed, uh, and um, it's through the third quarter, I think. And then uh, you had about 800,000 come online. Um, again, uh, I, I, a place like Phoenix is growing. You'll you'll get you know some shopping centers built. I shouldn't say some some basically neighborhood centers built, uh, but that's about it. Um, and uh, this is the reason. Uh, um, I'll just tell you my ex experience. My, we we uh, live in the waterfront in Scottsdale and Camelback, and who knew there was a mall next door? What a surprise! You know? so, um, so my wife, who used to live in malls, now I don't think has been one in six months, but every day three boxes go up, and the next day four boxes are sent back. I don't understand. <laughs> Uh, that, that, this is something that's not going away, uh, and obviously the nature of shopping centers is changing. And that's true despite that retail sales have been very strong during this whole cycle. All right, so where, what's our overall conclusion? The rate of growth is likely to slow somewhat in 2019. should still be a good year. The economics are still strong. The psychology is turning negative, and that's the part that, that bothers me. Uh, but uh, overall, um, uh, things are really... Not bad at all, despite everything you see, and despite the fact that, again, this cycle's getting old and you're starting to see some imbalances, uh, we're probably in the bottom of the seventh, the top of the eighth, of what has been a very long game, and uh, uh, there's nothing that suggests when a recession does show up, and they invariably, it invariably will, that it's going to be anything like 2007, 2000, through 2009. Thank you very much.